National Training and Development Curriculum for Foster and Adoptive Parents. No one is born resilient. The ability to bounce back from adversity develops over time. The combined result of temperament, attuned parenting, healthy attachments, and plenty of practice. But children who have experienced trauma, grief, and loss may not have had opportunities to develop a strong resilience. Resilient children are made, not born, a quote by Dr. Bruce D. Perry. In this video, we will explore ways to build resilience in these children. We'll formulate a working definition of resilience, discover the protective factors that support resilience, and identify the building blocks of resilience. We'll hear from leading researchers and clinicians who specialize in the study and practice of resilience. Photos appear of Shaylin Soma, PsyD, National Institute for Trauma and Loss in Children, Ann Mastin, Ph.D., the Institute of Child Development, University of Minnesota, and Jennifer Walbridge, MS, MSW, Family Therapist, The Baby Fold, followed by photos of Lori and Randy Ross, foster and adoptive parents, and Shannon Reagan Shaw, foster and adoptive parent. And we'll visit with experienced parents to observe firsthand how a family can build resilience in children despite adversity. We begin with a definition. In the physical world, resilience means elasticity, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. In the context of this video, resilience refers to a child's ability to bounce back, to manage the stress of challenging or even traumatic events. Jennifer Walbridge, Family Therapist, The Baby Fold. Resilience in its simplest form is the ability to bounce back from um, an adverse experience. When we're talking about resilience and trauma, it's the ability to um, return to a normal functioning state after experiencing a traumatic event. Lori and Randy Ross, foster and adoptive parents. Resilience is the ability to uh, encounter challenges or obstacles or setbacks and be able to um, learn and grow and move forward despite those things. Shaylin Soma, PsyD, Chief Clinical Officer, Star Commonwealth. You know, to flourish emotionally, behaviorally, spiritually, in, uh, in relationships, at school, despite adversity. Shannon Reagan Shaw, foster and adoptive parent. Foster parents or adoptive parents play a really critical role in helping to build resiliency for kids. Ann Mastin, PhD, Regents Professor of Child Development, University of Minnesota. The whole idea of fostering and adopting children is to mobilize the most powerful adaptive protective system we know of, which is caring and loving adults and the stability that can be provided by a positive family. The impact of trauma. Sometimes people talk about children as if they're naturally resilient, but any person, child or adult, can be overwhelmed by the challenges that they're experiencing. The resilience myth. If you've come from a traumatic background, if you've struggled and had um, lots of time where your needs weren't met, um, that ability to just bounce back that people assume that little kids have is that's that's a myth that's not real kids who have suffered all kinds of trauma um, do not just bounce back what's most most valuable family they have to be nurtured within an environment that recognizes the challenges they face and feel like you matter to people and to mm -hmm. feel important yeah. and they need to be re taught, re-nurtured um, in, into how to navigate hard situations. Well, maybe we should talk about how to make that better. Yeah. To create an environment that supports resilience, parents who are fostering or adopting need to integrate protective factors into that environment, starting with a caring family that is attuned to the child's needs. A family that cares, parents that care, is the most powerful protective factor we know of. Picture a seesaw or scale. On one side are negative outcomes. On the other side, positive outcomes. The fulcrum in the middle represents a child's temperament, genetics, and environment, tipping the starting balance one way or the other. 
Adverse childhood experiences create risk factors and tip the scale toward negative outcomes. Risk factors of domestic violence, parental mental illness, and parental substance abuse drop to the negative outcome side of the seesaw. So if you have had an early life that was filled with lots of changes in caregivers, changes in, in placements, in early life abuse or neglect, or been prenatally exposed to drugs or alcohol, you're starting out kind of facing an uphill battle. Notice how the adverse experiences weigh the seesaw down on the side of negative outcomes. It will take positive experiences, protective factors, to counterbalance the risk factors. A caring family is the most important one. For parents to provide those positive experiences, they themselves must be resilient. Protective factors of a caring family and caregiver resilience drop to the positive outcome side of the seesaw and start to level the seesaw. The children that we're taking care of are looking to us as a model and a guide for how they should overcome challenges in their own life. So when we have the ability to step back and take good care of ourselves and try again when things aren't going well, we can demonstrate through our actions, through how we care for ourselves and how we keep showing up every day, that's what resiliency is all about. And those are exactly the same qualities that we want to foster in our children. When there's more than one parent in the picture, the stability of that partnership serves as both a model of healthy relationships and a source of security. When the adults in charge are on the same page, children feel safe and secure. Yeah. The Ross family around the kitchen island. Randy reads the newspaper while a child stands next to him with his arm around him. Lori leans in towards them and speaks. What do you need to say? Oh, you're awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're awesome. That's awesome. That's and it starts with you and I being here or the partners of a household. In our relationship, being able to model um, mutual respect, conversation, um, problem solving skills with each other. That is something that is just a part of their world every day that they get to observe. Supportive relationships outside of the home and family are also key. We've surrounded ourselves in every possible way with the supports that are necessary for our kids. We um, have that in home health, but we also have them in appropriate school settings, therapeutic day treatment school, rather than the school that kicks you out every time you get in trouble. Good, good partnership with a the therapist, great partnership with the pediatrician, and then surrounding ourselves with the supports in the community that were necessary to be able to uh, get them outside of these walls and into the community. Because they're born a dark color, so you know the baby horse? Yeah. He's we found a stable that is actually relatively close that would do horsemanship lessons with them, the two of them together for an hour a week. And our goal is simply that they're able to have a relationship with the horse, that they're able to uh, learn about caring for an animal also following directions and learning to be able to gently give the horse directions. All of those things are super good for their brains. It has been really helpful. At the horse stables, Lori sits and speaks with a person. And for her that day, if it is just being able to go around the arena and not have a meltdown, we call that a win. And the girls are making amazing progress. A sense of safety, both physical and emotional, is another protective factor. It's not enough to be safe. Children need to feel safe. Felt safety is when the child feels emotionally safe. So they might physically know that they're safe, but there's a difference between physically knowing that you're safe and being comfortable and feeling like I'm not vulnerable. I think one of the critical things is it's more than just words. When we're teaching those lessons to our children, we have to believe it and we have to project it um, from our eyes and from our face and from our body language. Children who've had unstable backgrounds or experienced a lot of stress, they often find it very reassuring to have routines that are really positive in a family. And some of those routines are like bedtime routines and stories and that sort of thing. It creates a recovery environment. So we 
try to incorporate lots of different little activities into everyday life. And we do a lot of things that are just very routine. We eat dinner about the same time every night, we do chores, we take baths, but the reality is that within the scope of that, um, we can channel specific people into doing specific activities in order to try to maintain the, the calm that we want to try to have in the house. Kids feel very safe and regulated when there are rules and boundaries in place. So that's an important skill for parents to have. And what we're talking about is loving and supporting and providing good experiences, but not without rules and boundaries because that makes kids feel safe. Parents are always providing modeling and feedback that shapes a lot of the ideas and behaviors of their children. And they also, you know, enrich their development in many different ways by reading books, by bringing children to have fun experiences. You know, those, all of those enriching experiences become part of the knowledge and capacity that children can bring to new situations in the future. Advocacy is a crucial protective factor for children who may feel they have no voice of their own. Advocacy is a key part of building resilience for you as a parent to set the stage for your kids, but also by role modeling that. I want all of my kids to learn how to be good advocates for themselves. Um, and that then allows them to solve their problems and makes them more resilient human beings, right? Um, so you role model that for your kids as a parent when you fight for them. You also teach them when you fight for them that they matter enough to you to fight for. They're learning from you what their value is. The presence of certain factors or conditions are essential for resilience to develop. Think of these as building blocks of resilience. Really to nurture and foster resilience requires sort of, I would say, four main things. And the first is this, um, this sense of belonging or connection. Not every child is ready to join a group or a team or even to make friends. A stable and nurturing family is a safe place to learn social skills and explore interests. You, you, already, had them. you already had them. No, I didn't. Is it your turn, Jakeem? Yes. Yeah. While you're developing that relationship with them, you can be helping them by together exploring different things they might be interested, you know, kick around a soccer ball in the backyard or, or sing music together on the radio, read books together or, or different things that they like to do. And as that relationship becomes more secure, then they can take those talents and interests that you've started doing with them in relationship and go off on their own and do that with peers or other people. A lot of the most powerful protective systems for human beings are embedded in positive relationships with other people. The second is sort of this perceived sense of control or efficacy, you know, what I call mastery, but it doesn't mean perfection. It means you're, you're finding something that that child is good at and allowing them to practice that or engage in the experience of that. I'm good at a sport, I'm good at maybe an academic subject, I'm good at making people laugh. So say you have a kid who's really struggling in lots of areas, but they are very kind and loving to little kids. What does create positive self-esteem is giving kids the opportunity to be of value to some other being. Mom, is it okay if I can go swimming? Hey, Katie, are you willing to go swimming with Sophia? Sure. Awesome, thanks. All right, why don't you go get your swimsuit on? encouraging kindness between kids to each other because a kid who's being kind to their sibling begins to feel better about themselves and more valuable as a human being. One of the most important things that parents do in their interactions with children is to provide them with opportunities to explore, to learn, and to learn also that, you know, you can't always expect success the first try. I think all children need the experience of failing in a manageable way, not devastating failure, but, but small failures where you learn how to regroup, how to get up and start again are very important for kids. So mastery in life happens one step at a time, but they need a chance to do it on their own. The third one 
is a big one, and this is sort of this sense that a child can keep themselves regulated. So we know that kids who have experienced stress and trauma sometimes experience a lot of dysregulation. So teaching kids how to regulate themselves, so teaching them how they feel when they get angry or worried or scared and what happens in their body, and then engaging them in things that make them feel better. It can be wrapped into chores, it can be wrapped into playing outside, and it really doesn't look like prescriptive activities, but you know, we may uh, see a kid struggling and say, Hank needs to go out, would you take the dog out and take him for a walk? And the opportunity to do that, go outside and get some stimulation by walking and moving and holding onto the leash. It may be a breathing, um, relaxation activity. So big in, long and slow out. Doing the foot rubbing, which is actually foot reflexology, the goal is really twofold. One is to have healthy one-on-one -on -one interaction with grandma, and it's also um, the touch and the movement on your feet is very good for your neurology. It is phenomenal for our kids and their brains. Emma's one of my favorites, too. Cheyenne has a weighted blanket. Um, when she is feeling stressed out, she goes into her room. It's just her room. Um, she can turn on some calming music. She has a calming music station she listens to, and she can lay on her bed and try to get herself calmed back down. And then the last one is just this kind of sense of who a child is. So just letting kids share their value with others. So providing kids with opportunities to be generous to others. So how are we letting our kids help others? Are we doing service projects? Are we volunteering? Are we donating? So again, a lot of kids who have um, come from traumatic situations always feel like people are helping me because I'm broken, right? So instead, what we wanna do is reframe and say, we have value. And when we offer that in a generous way to others, it makes us feel good about ourselves. So parents have a lot of roles to play. We're gonna be the people who tell you the truth and hold you accountable, but we're also gonna be the people who um, are most excited for you when things go well, who are gonna wrap you in love and support no matter what. They are helping their children to develop a sense of security and hope for the future. When they know that they are precious, when they know that they are valued, they develop the inner belief that they can overcome whatever stressful situation might be presenting itself. For me, what I want for my children, no matter whether they were birthed by me or joined our family through foster care or adoption, is not only the opportunity to survive, I want them to thrive. I want to see them um, reclaim their potential to be who they have the potential to be. This video was funded by the Children's Bureau, Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, under grant number 90CO1134. The contents of this video are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of the Children's Bureau.